All right. My, my penalty for talking to Ken is I get to introduce him. Uh, and I hate those things where they say, this person needs no introduction, because if oh. that was the case, they wouldn't have me introduce him. Um, and the reason we were delayed, I was just showing him the video of the cliff dive thing, which I, which I found. Uh, I've known Ken since, uh, actually, I think I met him at the writing of the manifesto. And at that time, I knew nothing about, about Scrum. So Ken and Jeff and uh, Mike Beadle were all there. And so I was kind of squinting at it. Actually, I read their first paper in 1994. They wrote a paper. For and at the, and, yeah. Um, and I think it was submitted to IEEE Transactions on Software Engineering. Yeah. And I rejected it. I, I voted for it to be rejected uh, because it didn't contain anything. Right? I was a software guy. <clears throat> I was a methodology specialist. And what they said was, get together and talk about something every month and then do it. And I go, I'm sorry, you have to have more detail than that. Like, I'm, I, know nothing, I know methodology. You, you can't get away with just telling us that, that you just get together every month and talk about it and, and, then, and then work for a month and then get together at the end of the month and talk about it again. I'm sorry, it won't work. Yeah, so I was wrong, by the way. <laughs> no, we were encumbered. I was, I was working for IBM. Okay, so Ken Schwaber, yeah. yeah. Hmm, how did that slip out? Okay, um, so we, we got to meet properly in, in 2001, and then uh, I watched, as, as Ken said, uh, at that time, we had, we had an agreement that all 17 of us had to be in unanimous agreement to agree on anything because we had written that, the Agile Manifesto with, a, with absolute unanimity on every word inside those, those four values and stuff like that. And that was slowing us down, so we, we couldn't get anything done after that. And Ken, Ken said, uh, could I get permission to start the Agile Alliance and, you know, and, and start something? And I want to use the word Agile Alliance. And we had, a, we had our last unanimous vote, which we unanimously voted that we would not need unanimous votes anymore. Right? So that was a very, everybody was looking around like this. Is this going to work? What does it mean to do this? And so Ken took off and created the Agile Alliance uh, from there and ran that for some years and then um, created then the, the Scrum Alliance and ran that for some years. Is now a running scrum.org or whatever, whatever he's doing. And as far as I'm concerned, oh, oh, oh. Could I have a request to tell a little anecdote about Ken? I, I always like to tell people to their face what I tell other people about them. Since I, since I tell this to everybody in all of my Scrum classes and Ken hasn't heard it, so uh -oh. I, got to, I got to tell him. So I tell this to literally everybody, including the class of it. Okay. So, it was 2004 or five or something like that, and I get this weird little email where someone writes in there under their name, certified Scrum Master. I'm like, what the H is that? You know? And then I see a few more of these things. I go, what is that? And then I find out it's a two-day class, right? It's a two-day breathing exercise. And I, don't, I go, why is anybody even proud enough to write that after a two-day thing that they're going to write certified Scrum Master on there? And, and you also get to correct the mythology. I try to get my myths correct. So I'm, I'm telling Ken all the stuff that I tell everybody else. Um, so how did the certified Scrum Master thing come around? Well, so there's Ken in Boston or someplace in a big company. And he's wanted to teach a class. And the exec says to him, no, 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 no. We, we have to have a certification, you know, if we're going to have a class. And Ken's a smart guy, so he goes, I can do that. <laughs> yeah, sure. Certified Scrum Master okay. class. Boom. You're certified. Yeah. Am I about correct with that piece of the story? Is it? Is yeah, it? you're yeah. going. Yeah, cool, right? So that's the first part of the story I'm right on. So then, so then he says, yeah, and then somebody else says, hey, I like that, Ken, can I, can I do that too? And he goes, he goes, sure. And then the guy sends him, starts sending him attendee list, and he goes, crap, I got to keep track of all these people now. Okay, yeah, give me a couple of bucks, give me 50 bucks for everybody, I'll, do the, I'll run the database stuff, right? And then the thing got out of hand. So we have all these people who, who breathe for two days, and they become certified scrum masters. Now, I'm, I have a three-day class. Like, I'm a tough guy. You have to breathe for three days to get a certified Scrum Master from my class, right? Mm -hmm. And I promise you, I have not given a certified Scrum Master to certificate to anybody who stopped breathing inside of those three days, right? I'm, like, I'm serious about it. So you got to finish breathing all three days. Serious. Right? So, so this, thing's, you know, this thing's a hoax, right? This thing, you know, you know it's a game, right? It's just like breathe for three days and everybody else get a course, course attendance certificate. You do this. But here's where, the, here's where the weird boomerang thing happens, is because we have been trying for decades to get big companies like Martin Marietta and Lockheed and, you know, you forget the government, to work in incremental iterative fashion. And we failed. Since the 70s, we've been trying to do this, and I took my turn in the 90s. Through this weird little certificate, we now have got 200,000 certified scrum masters running around the world yelling pigs and chickens and impediments and scrum masters and stuff like that. And they're, and, they're, and they're all through Martin Marietta and Lockheed and big companies. 
And through this weird little certificate, these big companies are now doing incremental iterative development with Scrum, and, and they're doing the stuff. So I just figure that Ken has earned an island in the Bahamas through having started this, and I don't think you, you get enough reward. So I think that you know the industry ought to fund for you to have an island in the Bahamas. I like that. Yeah, so for having started the whole certified Scrum Master thing. So with that, I'm going to give it over to... Isn't yeah. it funny? It's a little like um, a mold or a fungus. It spreads. Yeah, it is. It's and, incredible. But here's the weird part. Is that funny little thing that I made fun of, right, has literally changed the world. So yeah. thanks for that, Ken. And Here saved our profession. There you go. Thank you, Elster. <laughs> Elster and I agreed that um, having someone come up and say, and here's Ken, and he needs no introduction. Everyone sits there and goes, Who's he? Um, was kind of useless, and so he agreed to do this, which was much better. He and I have gone back, like you said, for years and years and years, so um, this is all a good thing. Good to see you again. This is the sixth um, Path to Agility Koha thing that I've been to. I was at the first one. I really liked the first ones where I could go to a movie afterwards. I mean, what more do you want from life? And um, I've watched the Columbus, and then as Columbus expanded through the Midwest, become really the hub of thinking about agility, thinking about new ways of developing software, of building software organizations. Um, it's, a, it's a real pleasure. I mean, literally, you've taken what should have been Chicago's and other places like that and made it yours. So this is, um, by the way, how many of you are on Scrum teams now? Good, excellent. And like Elster said, it's, it's not like something you evaluate and say, are you doing Scrum? You know, like it's, it's really the thinking. We are not so much agile or not so much Scrum as we are post waterfall. We have left that still use it some places, but we've left that largely for a way that is more conducive to the type of society and the needs of that society and the software that we use and to delivering that software. And that is embodied in the ideas of iterative incremental, in teams that make up the, their ideas about how to do the best things best, and by all the new techniques and by all the new tooling that, um, that has put pressure on organizations to create. So this has been you know, a tremendously exciting time. And those of you who were still alive and could think in 2001, some of you weren't born then, um, if you look back on where software was then, that was Web 2.0. Oh, maybe someday we'll do commerce on the web. That was when AOL bought Time Warner. I mean, and now we've shifted to where you know, you've got a huge processor in your pocket with your smartphone. You've got software being downloaded all the time that works. I mean, tremendous shift in capability. Um, and, and all of that has come about in a very, very short time. The difference between 1980 and 2001 compared to 2001, 2015 is profound. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about scaling, which has certainly been um, an interesting topic. Um, and I have a very focused um, view of it that I'd like to share with you, because I've helped a number of organizations scale. And I've helped you know, them scale from like probably some of your teams, three or four teams, up to 1,000 people, um, the Fighter of the Future Project, Lockheed Martin, McCann those types of organizations. So there are ways of doing it. But the thing that you do need to understand is there is no simple way to do something that hard. So if anyone says, oh, this is really simple, here it is, um, keep your wallet in your pocket. Because it requires a lot of intelligence, a lot of insight, a lot of hard work. Those of you that have read the Phoenix Project, which is the um, heartbeat of DevOps, we'll see lean and some ideas of agile being applied, but you'll see that there's a lot of investigation, a lot of determination of problems, a lot of working of problems, a lot of thinking, a lot of hard work, and 
that's the essence of this. And that's why you wake up in the morning, not for simple things, but because we like hard problems and creating solutions for them. So you're going to talk about scaling. Um, I have a, this is either a cane, because I like hiking, and unfortunately I'm not as good a hiker as the mountains I use. So this is either a cane or a golf club. Your choice. Um, and we got to know golf as kids really well because my father was a scratch golfer. And it wasn't until I got to be about 30 years old that I discovered what a scratch golfer was. Um, it wasn't someone whose score was consistent. We would always see my father get up and at the tee, and right before he hit the ball, he would go like... And we thought that's what a scratch golfer was. <laughs> and we always wondered why in the pro shop they kept laughing when we would talk about our father, the scratch golfer. But, you know, there we go. So this is the um, idea symbol for... Um, that we have for scaling Scrum. And it's just saying it's an integration sign of integrating all the work from one team up to how many of our teams you're using. Um, guess what? There's a point where you can't integrate the work at some point. So it depends on your competence and confidence and skills. You can integrate the work of a lot of teams. And what we found is in, in many organizations that are entertaining the idea of scaling now, um, they started and they had a number of small teams that were doing really, really incredibly better than they'd seen before. And what management found is they wanted to take and realize those benefits on larger initiatives, larger initiatives that perhaps they thought would be very risky, and they wanted to keep some better control and have some better outcomes than they would have in the past. And what these organizations tend to be looking for is a straightforward approach to being able to scale and take advantage of the way that they did things with small groups, which of course um, makes them susceptible to snake oil salesmen and all sorts of things like that, because people still are looking for silver bullets. What I have to tell you is this is not a silver bullet. This is just like reading the books by Goldratt and the Goal. This is like any lean thing. This is like Phoenix Project. This is something that requires skill which is good, because who wants to do otherwise? Now, what I thought I'd cover with you is our four things. One, what is our thinking behind this? So rather than just, here it is, guess why it works. Why did we construct it in this way? Second thing is, what did we construct? What is this approach? Third is, if you use this approach on something really, really big, does it work? And the fourth is, how do you manage and know whether this is succeeding or not? Four things. So first thing, a number of you are on scrum teams now, so this is you on a scrum team. I know, it doesn't look quite like you. And you've got a product backlog, hopefully, well formulated. And you're going to select some work from the product backlog, hopefully the most valuable work that the product owner has queued up. And you're going to hopefully select work that you have skills to do and you've got knowledge of and the product owner will work with you on. And you're going to take that work and you're going to, ugh, yeah, unless you've got Greenfield system, you've got existing systems, which has design and architecture all over the place and code in different places. And you're going to take that work that you've selected, those requirements, and you're going to take it and you're going to hopefully get it in one small area so that when you go to do it, you're not in this part of the design and that part of the design. So you're not all over the place, but you're instead focusing your work and bringing it into a usable increment by the end of the sprint. Not bad. One team, you know, we can do this, even get something good in the first sprint we ever do. However, um, someone says, hey, can you do that? With two teams? With three teams? Say, so, yeah, I don't know. So we get three teams together, and we, again, all get together. We probably ought to talk. So we select product backlog that isn't lying on top of each other and which will implement in the same parts or different parts of the system so that we can minimize our dependencies. 
We want to make sure our teams have the people who know those requirements and know that part of the system so that we aren't always going to someone else saying, hey, how do you do this? And usually we're stuck with about the same software. And then we go look and we start building our sprint backlog and we look where our um, work is going to exist. And typically, you know, it's somewhat independent, somewhat separated from the other work, but typically there's some sort of dependencies between our work and the work and the other teams. That's the way product backlog tends to be ordered. And so we have to work between each other and say, hey, you know, this is the idea of the scrum scrums. Hey, we're going to be working da 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 And are you going to be working there too? And oh, well, yeah. Oh, shoot. Well, we're using a code base repository in the LM system, so we're going to be knocked out. OK, let's create a branch. So you start thinking about all these things. And what this means is that when you have three teams, if you have a velocity of 10 on one team, it typically means you will not get 10 plus 10 plus 10 when you have three teams, because you've got to work through those dependencies. You've got to talk to each other. So you get some drag, and it depends on you know, how the teams are laid out and how it's organized, but the drag might drag you down anywhere from 25 even down to 10. Depends. Not predictable. And the thing that drags you down is the people. Hey, you're on that team, but I really need your knowledge over here on this team. And yet you guys committed to that sprint goal, and we have this one. Um, the domain, I understand this type of work and understand what it has to be when it's done, but I need to talk to you so that our work pulls together. The technology, oh my god, you're going into that part of the design, and that is going to affect that software we're using. So you need to talk to each other about how you're going to be using it and changing it. And the last is the actual software itself. This object was not actually ever refactored. It's actually all over the place in many different classes. So we've got to look at this to make this happen. And what you have is then a lot of talking, a lot of coordination, a lot of um, working together between three teams as needed. Now, if all those things I said are not true, if you have a beautiful system to keep you on the right teams, domain knowledge apportioned appropriately, et cetera, maybe you'll get toward the 30 as a total velocity. Someone said, hey, if they can do it with three, why don't we do it with nine? Or actually, what I tend to get is like I got at Lockheed Martin, where they said, we have four subcontractors, and we have 900 people. Can you help us formulate a way to get them working on scrum teams to deliver this? You're like, who told you 900 was the right number? So, well, 900 is 90 times 10, so that's <laughs> We've got to remove the batteries from the calculators, right? So anyway, you got nine teams, and they all, at the start of the sprint, go to the same product backlog, and oh my god. I mean, a lot of conversation, a lot of thinking. Um, we did this at Intuit with 700 people, and the conversations not only were at the start of the sprint, they happened throughout the sprint because there was so much to understand and so much to think about what you're going to be doing. Ha. And of course, same software. The problem is that when these nine teams have selected, even with all their forethought, they're working in an area like this. The, the area amount they're working in each other's backyard and needing each other's help to make something happen is daunting. And it requires a lot of goodwill. It requires a lot of thinking. And it requires a tolerance that what they think they can do often is not what they can deliver because they don't know what they can do until they start doing it. You get better across time, but software that's already been built has a um, nasty habit of sneaking up and surprising you. So nine teams maybe won't give you 90 story points. Maybe it'll only give you 30, 40. And at that point, you have to start weighing, why are we investing in nine teams? Probably not for productivity. Probably because of domain knowledge, so you can get all nine areas going at once. A lot of reasons, but the anticipation of the same thing we had with one team times nine, yeah. And again, when I say, what you're hearing are opinions, right? Based on experience, based on things I've done. You may have other experience that's better. I hope so. 
So the t essence of scaling, the thinking we're basing all of our stuff on, are two problems, two things that need to be done. One is before you start working, you need to remove as many dependencies as you can. You need to remove the dependencies so that teams are working on things that are as insular as possible, so that the work we do doesn't depend upon the work of any other thing inside the entire development effort or even outside of it, and that we can actually have a free flow toward delivering something. And that type of work to make sure that we remove dependencies isn't something we just now do at this sprint planning meeting. We have to do it throughout because we always have product backlog coming up. We always have new ideas coming up. As we get into the code, we discover new stuff that we didn't know before. And so this removing of dependencies and organizing and allocating our work needs to be done almost continuously. It chews up a good 10 to 40% of the capacity of maybe a 10, 15 per team development effort. Um, the other thing you have to be able to master is the idea, and this is not a religious phrase, it sounds like it, reification. The idea of taking a whole bunch of work and making something real or usable out of it. And what we're looking at doing is the idea of taking our work frequently during our sprint and seeing if we have removed all the dependencies. If we have, then the work will integrate together and be usable. If we haven't, like you still got code checked out and you have code that's going to collide with it and when we build it, we're missing a module, um, then we know that we can do something about it before it builds up into technical debt that kills our sprint. So reification is the idea of testing that our work on doing the dependency removal has been effective and to the extent that it hasn't been totally effective, that gives us a chance to go back in and further remove the dependencies so we have something that's usable. If you have 20 teams, you need to do this at maybe continuously. If you have one team, maybe once a sprint. If you have five teams, maybe you ought to be doing this every couple days. If you have 10 teams, maybe every day. So, depending upon how quickly the dependencies will build up and catch you, you need to be doing things that allow you to reify your work, and that includes doing continuous check-in of your code, continuous build, continuous deployment, continuous testing of the software. And fortunately, a lot of us have had a lot of experience with that over the last five, six years, because it's what's demanded of us. So two things, dependencies, identify and remove them so that we can work on work that is isolated and insular to whatever degree we can, and reification testing that our assumptions are correct. And I wrote up here um, the idea that Alistair had of Shin, or Kokora, of the heart. This is, the reification is the heart of scaling. It is where you see what other work you have to do to make sure that this actually is building a product that's usable. And it tests all of your assumptions, it tests all of your prior work. So you can scale as long as you continuously identify and remove dependencies, integrate the work at all levels, create and inspect integrated increments frequently, provide adequate tools and skills so that people know how to do and use all this stuff, and inspect and adapt frequently. Inspecting and adapting. Just like, again, I was talking about the Lean and the Phoenix project, the thing that is the real core of all this is looking and seeing where you are, maintaining transparency and doing something about it, rather than yielding to the pressure of you gotta do more because more that's not good, that's not reified, is not more, it's less. So what we have to do this is we came up with the idea of a nexus. Now, that's not LexisNexis, that's not Nexus from Google. That's, nexus is an integration point, something that communicates, creates a communication pathway amongst all the work that's going on. One of the things I've been alluding to is very important for everyone to know what's going on so they can 
work out dependencies, reify, and then move on. And that's a lot of communication. And in most of the organizations I've worked with, we come up with it ad hoc based on their organizational skills. But what we find is a lot of pressure for a, a out of the box framework, which will allow people to apply a simple approach to this that they can then modulate to their organization's capabilities. And that's the nexus. So this is, for those of you that recognize this, this is a scrum team. This is good life, right? <sighs> those were the days. By the way, Alistair and I are gonna give a short talk this afternoon, you know, a fireside chat without a fire. And Alistair has a great story about the five things of Scrum, and that's it. Someone ought to ask him. This is Nexus. Now, if you notice, we have the little Scrum teams in the center around their integrated work, but we've got around them an exoskeleton, a framework that is there solely for the purpose of identifying dependencies and seeing if their work can be integrated or reified and then delivering it. And all the things that are around it are based on existing Scrum artifacts, knowledge, um, events. So it's all based on your current knowledge. It's just extending it to have a, to be an exoskeleton over the work of any number of teams that you have working on the scaled effort. And you'll notice it's got, again, one product backlog. It's got a nexus sprint planning. Whoa, what's that? Well, if you're doing sprint planning and you're selecting product backlog that you're going to work on and turning it into sprint backlog, and you've got, let's say, eight teams, other teams, it's really good to have all of you in a way of communicating so you understand what the implications are. And you can adjust the work to optimize it. Um, Nexus Sprint Backlog tends to be one backlog of all the work, and we've got methods and techniques for doing that. And I'll go into some of this, but the whole thing is an exoskeleton that rides above the actual teams doing the work. And it, it takes the um, communications, the events, the information from the teams and causes them to work together to make decisions about it. So for instance, the daily scrum one of the big events in the daily scrum is taking the sprint backlog, the Nexus sprint backlog, and looking and seeing where we are. Now to see where we are, and this is just, again, the thinking based on dependencies and reification, in order to know where we are, our sprint backlog can't be in tasks. Because if I've done seven tasks, that doesn't tell me where I am out of doing 32 tasks. But if I take my product backlog items and I make them thin sliced test driven development, except in test driven development um, items, and we are finishing those every couple of days, then I know, really know what I have completed and what I haven't completed in functional terms. So the formulation of the sprint backlog becomes a little different so that we can create more communication, better inspect and adapt, better reification. So sprint backlog, a little different. Um, next is sprint review, probably a sprint review where you look at the nine or 10 or 14 increments that the teams build isn't very interesting. Matter of fact, I've seen when you've done that, teams tend to present their sprint increment in their branch of the code. But if you require that they instead show an integrated increment to the product owner, guess what? They have to collapse their branches into one code base that integrates, builds, and can be delivered. So it's got, you know, this is all common sense. Any of you who've gone through any sort of scaling work or no scrum know that you need to do these things. And all this is doing is backing you up and saying, yep, that's right. Ah. So Nexus doesn't replace scrum, it augments scrum. It builds on all the scrum principles, values, and foundations. It widens and deepens the inspect and adapt mechanisms. It fosters continued transparency despite the number of teams that are working. And it relies on bottom-up intelligence, continually driving intelligence up so we can see what's really going on. It issues, as in spits on, doesn't like, scratches, solutions that are fixed, 
that are defined and add overhead to the work that you're doing beyond and above what's needed. So again, this is a, here's a frame, another framework, another exoskeleton. Use it and drive it to the level of detail that's needed to provide the results that you want. So it's results driven rather than methodology driven. The skeleton, the um, nexus itself, it's got 40 new practices. Wow, I must have been sitting in the basement thinking up new practices left and right. Actually, it has no new practices. All it does is call on the use of practices that are well known in the software development community um, for dependency removal, so st user story mapping, um, dependency mapping, dependency removal, um, continuous development, um, branching. It calls upon the use of those and or something else you use in your organization that does the same thing. But by calling out the use of practices different places in the Nexus exoskeleton, it's saying this is something that needs to be done here. If you aren't going to do it, you'll probably catch that you should have done that a little later. But in the meantime, use something that is well known in your organization that meets this need. So 40 practice areas. Those practice areas are fit into both normal Scrum as well as some new events, new role. It's got a new role. Wow. A Nexus integration team. Whatever that is. Talk about that in a minute. It's got new events that rest on top of and in some places supplant and replace the standard Scrum events. You still need it at the team level, but you need it at the across team level to provide information so the team knows whether what it's doing is useful or not. And it's got some new artifacts, the sprint backlog and the integrated increment. So this is the roles, new one, the events, the new ones, and the artifact, the new one. And that's all it is. You know, it's not a big deal. It's just a formulated way of doing this where if you already know Scrum, it should make sense. And these are some of the um, practices for removing dependencies and for causing reification. And none of these should be really you know, new. As a matter of fact, I can see this growing into a body of practices that can be applied at different points. Um, so you've got things like community of practice when you have scarce skills, continuous product backlog refinement, using microservices to mi miniaturize the amount of work that you're doing and let it integrate into, let's say, an iOS structure. Um, you've got reification, limited branching. I mean, this, this is going to hurt, right? Whenever we run into a problem, we branch. It's kind of like borrowing money. You're going to pay it back. And when you have 10, 9, 8 teams working together, the payback is usually crippling. So we have these practices. This Nexus integration team is a team that is not, it's kind of like the Scrum Master. It's not responsible for or accountable for, but it is there to work with all the teams to cause their work and teach the teams to work together in a way so they can remove the dependencies and can inspect and adapt frequently to remove um, any issues. And it consists of a Scrum Master, consists of a product owner who has the overall product backlog, and it probably has a systems engineer, and it probably has you know, a really good um, programmer, developer, designer. And these people either can also be on the Scrum teams. So if I have two teams and I'm using Nexus, probably dumb to have three Scrum masters, dumb to have three product owners. Probably one of each could fill all of them. But it's an accountability responsibility that that person has to make sure that the work is integrating, that the dependencies are being removed. We don't ask this team to set up the systems engineering environment. We don't ask them to set up the um, build environment or the code management. Instead, they act as consultants to the teams, and the teams do the work. This causes the teams to gain those skills and it also causes that awful moment where the team says, well, we would have done our work, but the Nexus integration systems engineer didn't have the build environment ready to not be there. So it's, it's more of a consultative, integrative role. 
and it's there. It becomes more and more critical and more and more critical that it be uniquely staffed as you have more and more teams doing the scaled effort. And important thing, composition may change. You know, the accountability responsibility, not an entitlement, certainly not an entitlement. You knew it. You knew if there were a nexus, there had to be a nexus plus, right? I already have the t-shirts printed. Those of you that have mastered Nexus, we're selling those for $10. The Nexus Plus is $11, right? And the reason there's something called Nexus Plus is we have found that the number of teams that you can scale using a Nexus is limited. You can't have 4,000 teams and one Nexus integration team holding it together. No sprints long enough. So what we found instead is where you have these knowledge of where the system code design architecture and tests are well formulated, well structured, don't have a lot of crap in it and something you're proud of, that's one thing. Another characteristic is there's a system and domain knowledge. Another characteristic is technical skills and the underlying automation that supports those skills. Scrum and agile practice capabilities, knowledge, and coherence and independence of work. If all those things are true, you can readily have more than nine teams in your effort, maybe up to 12, 13 teams. If you are weak in all these areas, less than nine teams, maybe no more than two or three teams, maybe no more than four teams. So what, what this is really saying is it takes skill, it takes um, effort, it takes a lot of practice to be able to do this. You can't throw this exoskeleton on any level of swap and say, oh, Ken said it works on nine teams. Maybe. You'll think you can find out. Try it, and you'll see by the amount of, we'll get to this in management, by the amount of stuff that it throws off whether this is working or not. I do like that button. So the challenge that we found with large-scale development, more than nine teams, is that when you start getting above um, nine teams, based on our experience, the dependencies and integration issues that happen are hugely magnified, and they are not linearly magnified, they are exponentially magnified. They do not grow in a nice orderly fashion. They grow in a way where it can overtake and overwhelm an effort. And what's needed in those situations where you find that the number of dependencies and the number of integrations are overwhelming you is some sort of architecture or design in place that standardizes the way people will do their work so that it, if you follow these rules, it automatically integrates. And this means, yeah, architecture is emergent, but it is emergent within the framework of the purpose of the system. There, and there is no guaranteed recipe at this scale. Every project is unique. You get into it and you find out, is that architecture really gonna support this many people or not? And if not, what do we do? Good thing is you can always go back and use fewer teams. And this was a, something from the chaos report again, and just saying, hey, small projects are a lot more successful than large projects. And all of us say, whoa, thanks for the information. <laughs> Didn't know that. Um, and we have two scaling options. One refers to the, um, what I just alluded to, where you have an architecture in place that lays out the way that the code that's being built has to interplay and the dependencies are set. And we call that a, um, a vertical, a horizontal scaling option where the platform is providing the stability. And examples of this being done tightly, and I've seen this at some of the oil companies. Um, you see this, those of you that have iPhones, see this when you buy an app. That app integrates through the SDK into iOS. And iOS provides the architectural standards that anyone building the app knows how to do it so it'll work with other apps. It provides the UI so it knows how um, things will go back and forth. And that's, we call it tightly or densely integrated because it provides a lot of structure for us doing things that'll interplay with each other without a lot of thinking, a lot of effort. 
Um, I have a, a car, um, it has an autopilot in it. And so it uses this huge NVIDIA game processor, it's a Tesla. And they download software to the car without me participating every week or two weeks or three weeks, which gives me functionality for blind spot monitoring, for adaptive cruise control, for all sorts of things. And my God, I get in the car, and after having tried this for a couple months, I get in with confidence that I'm not going to crash into something else. And that's because they're using the iOS. They built their own thing, but they're using their own iOS structure, and all their functionality works within those rules which contain the tests that determine that it meets the safety standards. But you have to have that thinking up front. You just don't let it emerge. Hi, I have a car that drives by itself, and the way it did, it emerged. Oh, yeah, after I hit that car and that car and that car. <sighs> um, medium integrations um, um, approaches are like the Microsoft component object model. It tells how you can work together with other things through the object model. Um, you've got product family architectures. You've got APIs that define how, when you build software, it will work to obtain services. And this goes into the microservices thing also. And then the loosely integrated nexuses are where they try to integrate through things that are usually unique to the application, like workflow. And so it's workflow that defines the integration patterns. And that's OK. But it pushes more work on the teams as they are doing their work that they have to change the way the workflow engine is structured. So you find development both being done on the supporting architecture and on the functionality. What we want to do is have as little work being done or segregated from the functional work as possible up in the architectural level so we're not going back and forth and having one group fail as they don't communicate with the other group. And this is not a new thing I'm telling you. If you look at the software that's emerging in our world, if you look at Smart Grid, if you look at Autopilot, um, if you look at any of those things, they're all based on these types of architectures. And literally, if you look at the app development community for the Android, for the Apple, those are hugely scaled development efforts. They're asynchronous. So iOS and SDK, I was giving a talk at Shell Oil. And the number of their teams have stopped trying to build applications, instead built their iOS and application development works at the SDK level. It's like, whoa. Same button. Um, the component object model is an integration point. And then this is what we did at Intuit. This is back in. 2006, when I was young and optimistic, where we had some seven or 800 developers. And we just caused our work to integrate frequently based on us inspecting what the requirements were going to be and talking a lot about it. And we probably chewed up, there was no integrating level. And what that um, caused was us to chew up some 40, 50% of all the time working dependencies. And as we did the reification, discovering what dependencies we had missed and going back and fixing them. So this is kind of like in the absence of tightly coupled scaling. This is loosely scaled, and the um, cost of the loose scaling is absorbed by the dependency and reification costs. This was um, loosely scaled, and this is a, another uh, I think five, 600 um, people were working on this. A lot of people, 800 people. And they decided that there was no way that they could pull together an integrated increment every sprint. It's probably a good idea. So they decided instead they were going to come up, and this is the senior vice president, we are going to have a release candidate. That means something I could release for all the customers every three sprints. So you guys go do what you want, come up with release, you know, integrated increments every sprint, but make sure they all pull together at the end of every three sprints into a release candidate. So we went through nine sprints and um, came to release because we were at the third release candidate, and we found that we were nowhere near ready for release. There were something like 4,500, 4,800 bugs, defects, what the vice president had been seeing was not integrated release candidates, but she had been seeing demonstrations of each team's um, 
code branch. So they'd been demonstrating from their own code branch rather than integrating it. Looked great. It wasn't a product, but it was a bunch of code branches. And they had to spend another five to six months integrating all that work and putting it back together in the used way of integrating to be, um, the, the um, defects to remove the dependencies, to remove the defects before they could release it. And even then when it was released, as you can imagine, when you try to fix something after it's broken, it's not nearly as good if you, as if you had built it right in the first place. So our habits, our, our, um, the pressure we're under to develop software often has us miss all those concepts in the Nexus, the Nexus Plus of reification and dependency because we've got too much to do. And when we ask the people, you know, why they did this, they said, well, you know, we had to deliver 34 product backlog items in the sprint. And to do that, if you take the number of teams, that means we had to do this many. And quite backward thinking to how many can you do if you do this properly. Example, study of people who take a huge number of developers and do continuous dependency identification, reification, and delivery. Google, huge. 4,000 builds and 60 million tests every day. So if anyone says, well, we can't do that here because that's too hard, what they're really saying are two things. One, we are going to have our skirts blown off by the people who can because this is the direction of software development. And two, not that we can't do it, but that we can't do it yet. Set a goal and work toward it. Of course, you can't do this tomorrow. But of course, you can move to it and toward it to the extent that it's cost justified. In the application, in the competitive marketplace you're in, identifies the cost justification. So these are just some questions that I always have when, when we look at scaling. Um, so first one is, how, what do we have to do to integrate the work, the process? How frequently do we have to do it to create a shippable product? And that depends on the number of teams and the quality of what's there. And how do you measure and manage the work and the integration? And we're all familiar with single or sec two scrum teams, you know, burn ups, burn downs, and velocity measurements in normal um, product backlog item uh, velocities. But a question you might want to apply to this is, how do I measure that so I know what the overhead of the integration is for the number of teams I'm using? Maybe we need to use 30 teams to do this, but what are we paying to do it? Maybe we can pay less and only use five teams and be four months later, but it'll be a lot less grief unless 30 teams is building a capacity in our organization to do this in the future. So are you balancing the costs and benefits of the overhead compared to the value? And then as you do this, so I, I mentioned maybe you have 20 teams and only they're delivering 100 um, velocity per sprint. What are you doing to continually increase the velocity? So if we build better tools, as we get better at dependency removal, better at reification, we should start seeing our delivered velocity, without being gamed, go up. And a way of managing this is to say, well, ooh, what if it isn't going up? What if it's going down? How much down can we afford to do? And why is it going down? But if I were in charge of this effort, um, and by the way, this whole effort is meant to report to a manager, someone who's responsible for the program. Um, I would want to know how my velocity is going so I get a sense of whether we're getting better or worse. And this is the types of velocities that we would expect to see, is that if I have 20 teams, and they can do 10 story points per sprint, and they're working all by themselves, they can do 200 story points per sprint. If I am the brilliant manager in charge of this effort, and I say who's going to be on which teams, and which product backlog items they're going to work on, and which area of the software they're going to work on, I can probably expect no more than 50 story points per sprint. Because I have just 
thrown in dependencies and stop the teams from resolving them themselves. If I tell the teams to go at it and form teams that are best structured to remove the dependencies and have them select the backlog and share people back and forth as they need, um, I can probably get drive it up to 80 or 90. Still not half, but pretty good. And if I use the ideas in Nexus and Nexus Plus to support this effort and put a formalization into it, I can probably get up 150, 160 into that area. I'm still going to pay for it, and I'm going to pay for the effort to get up there, but it allows me to start delivering some productivity. Now, you notice this isn't free productivity. This is earned productivity. We have an idea in here called descaling. The top line shows if it's a linear productivity gain per teams added. The lower line with the great red shows what we're actually realizing as we add teams on. So you might want to start with, not want to start with 20 teams, you might want to start with two and try four and then six. And you should see this, the velocity go up. But if the velocity instead You might be anticipating, based on the plan, that you're going to get something like this as you scale. This is number of, this is velocity, this is number of teams. And if instead you start seeing that, you know something's going on in there which is causing you to lose velocity. Dependencies are causing problems and they're not being resolved in a timely manner, and when you go to reify, people are struggling. And so one approach, rather than just letting people struggle and telling them to buck up and man, you know, staff better, is to descale. Say, well, let's identify what's going wrong. Let's go back some number of teams and have the other teams start working on the areas where we have problems, and let's go to an area where we are delivering productivity and we're not delivering frustration and crappy software. And then when we get that mastered, then let's go back up. This is common sense, but I'm trying to introduce a word so it becomes an acceptable phrase called descaling. You know, the opposite of scaling. Now there's another word where you, contrary to all advice, form a 40-person um, effort and you assign them who's going to be on the teams and what work they're going to do, and they start, and my God, you can't tell what's going on. They're just struggling. They're not delivering anything. It looks catatonic. And there we have a phrase, we're introducing a phrase um, which we think might be helpful, and it's where you have such a mess that things aren't working at all, you can blacken your screen, And that's called a scrumble. Not scrum, scrumble. And not scramble, scrumble. And it just says you have reached such a point that for the way you have structured this project and the work that is intended to be done and the tooling you have and the software you're going to do it in, you cannot be effective. And you've got to step back and revisit your plans, your assumptions, your assertions, your initiatives, and once you have thought this through again, then try it again. But you don't even have some core, some basis, some heart that you can build on. You've got to think this through again. So this is a formal thing saying, oops, let's think this through again and try it again. And maybe we'll try it a little slower, a little more structured thing, a little more self-organization. But we're going to take another crack at it. Um, scrumbles, by the way, if you look it up in Wikipedia, that are people on on the subways and that, they don't have a lot of time, so they build a little, knit something small, and the door opens, they got to their stop, and they throw it away. So a scrumble is a piece of knitting that no one's using. So you're basically with the scrumble saying, oh man, that didn't work, I gotta get off and stop and think this through again, see where I am, and you're gonna start again. So it's, in this we have manage it, manage it to optimize the benefits and the delivery, if you find that you are not getting the benefits you anticipate that you need to justify the effort, descale and take a look at it again. 
If you find that this is overwhelming you because this is new and the initial assumptions and assertions were too great, scrumble and start again. Um, I'm not going to go over this in a lot of detail. Um, we have some people out at the CareWorks Scrum Org booth who will walk you through it. It's a way of managing any software development area's output, the value of what they're generating. And it takes three dimensions. It says, what is the value you're delivering across time? So we measure this across time. What is the agility that you're leaving behind? So when we look at the ability to innovate, we need good software in good shape, people who like coming to work, all that, in order to be able to do it. And what is your time to market? So how agile are you in delivering the software? And um, these are just three sets of measurements called evidence-based management, which are used to measure the valuable output that software contributes to an organization. And when you start getting into scaling, where things are so um, you've got so many things in the air and so hard to necessarily know the value of what's being done. This is a good thing to put onto that program or to put onto that software development organization to gain a sense of how things are going and what the overall value to the organization is being created. Um, I think I talked about this last year and I felt kind of queasy doing it again this year because I feel like I'm nagging you. So this is there, it's useful. But the other thing I'm really here to talk about is there are ways to scale. Most of you are very familiar with them. Most of you experience them on single, two, three team efforts. And what we're doing is introducing um, both an exoskeleton and a framework through the Nexus Plus that gives you words, I think, that will support what you already know needs to be done. And the way we're going to be delivering this is we have right now, after, after much anguish and effort, some workshops, two-day workshops on what Nexus and Nexus Plus and management of this are. Um, just like we have a scrum guide, you know, really dirt simple, we're going to have a um, Nexus Plus or Nexus or SPS guide describing what those artifacts, roles, events are, as well as how the practices interplay amongst them and references to industry best practices. We'll probably have a, a, an assessment, because you know me, I can't do without an assessment, um, which will lead to certification that you were dumb enough to take the assessment and failed it. Sorry about that. Um, and, and these things, um, I think we have the workshops now. We're working on the guide. The, Assessment comes later, that's less important. Um, I think we have at our booth some handouts that describe this. We have this at our website, scrum.org. I think the good news, though, for you is it's probably not going to add anything that shocks you or is brand new. It's going to instead validate what you've been thinking all along. This is not new. This is simply supportive of what you've had to do already. What a surprise, huh? I'm done. Hold on. My father would be so proud. So Alistair and I are going to have a panel talk. We're a small panel. And um, the last time we did it, by the end of it, there was um, olive oil on the floor. We were naked. We were wrestling. Um, so Bart Murphy is going to facilitate it so that we do it in a more civilized way. Um, so you, if you have any questions, you can ask then. Um, are there any simple questions that I can perhaps answer or know the answers to? Yes? Here you go. Hey. Thank you. Thanks so much for your insight and your vision in where we should go next, uh, scaling up. I'm sorry, start again. Uh, thanks so much. Order. 
thanks so much for, for your vision and for your uh, uh, to path to how to scale up uh, you know, from projects to programs and so on. Uh, very much appreciate it. Um, you're, you're welcome. And what I always try to say is I know that you're going to wind up working harder than I do. <laughs> so I really appreciate your validation and your testing of this. Thank you. Um, I work in a large corporation, work for GE Aviation, and uh, we have a lot of complexity in our products, you know, making jet engines and whatnot, and also in the way that we put together our programs and projects uh, in, on IT to support engineers. And uh, I really appreciate uh, this um, new method or vision that you have. The question to me is that as with all this, of course, more data comes to be managed from all the projects coming together and to be rolled up. And that sounds to me as a program management method. Yep. Uh, of course, as we see the traditional program management product that exists out there, they're still struggling into catching up with Agile and the new way of doing things. Uh, perhaps yes. this could be a framework for the PMM you know, suppliers to take heed and try to give them a, a direction in where to, how to scale up or how to restructure their products so that they can really bring up the scaling and the, and the data and the analysis, understand where we are. So that they go Any beyond thoughts? having the need and can deliver against the need. I, I had hoped, um, I, I've, the community that I work with um, tends to be more toward the developers, the management, tends not to be at the program management level, which is a unique skill unto itself. It requires a politician, who has <laughs> tremendous patience and determination. Um, and I had hoped with um, some of the products I'd seen coming out of the last several years that we would get some relief at the program management level, but I don't see it yet. It's still, the things that we do that tend to support it tend to be discussion in the formulation of product backlog, um, but that's not the answer. You want it attached to strategy, you want it attached to value stream mapping, you want it attached to all sorts of things. Yes, best wishes. Uh, like Ken said, he'll be here for questions and uh, a facilitated, well, non-facilitated session, really. I don't know how you facilitate him or Alistair, to be honest. Uh, so please, get your questions ready, and we'll have a town hall style Q&A uh, after the lunch keynote. Thank you, Ken. Here. Guys, this always gets reversed. You applaud, right? I come here and talk and applaud. You go out and do the work. Thank you. <laughs>